habitat still look beautiful, but corals are dying at a staggering rate. Warming waters, pollution and overfishing have led to the loss of 50% of the world's corals in the last 30 years. If this is allowed to continue, its impact on the planet will be devastating. Reef ecologist Eric Hochberg and his team want to prove exactly why this is happening. They've been photographing major reefs around the world and are finishing their project here in Palau. These underwater tests are conducted to verify information gathered by a state-of-the-art NASA sensor attached to the team's plane. Is your hope that once this is done, you can then understand what's damaging each reef in each different part of the world? Or is it also to understand what could prevent further loss? Yes and yes. So we're going to visit hundreds of reefs with the airplane. I'm going to look for patterns. This is exploratory science. First time we're getting this data set, so we don't know what we'll find. When the project is finished, they will have mapped more of the world's coral reefs than ever before. This is the leading edge sensor for ocean remote sensing in the world. This is the prism we have it here. Right. We're using it. But, but so far, the amount of a reef that's been studied this comprehensively is 0.01% of the, of the world. That's what I would say. So we're going to get to about 2%. The only way to do it is with this technology. I'm amazed this hasn't been done before. When you think of something so, so valuable and so... Yeah, you know, it's, it's, it's been done at Mars and it's been done at the moon. We just haven't done it here on Earth. <laughs> Exactly. This is the most extensive uniform reef survey that has been conducted. What's already known is that corals are being stressed by extreme changes to their environment. When this happens, they lose their algae and turn white in a phenomenon known as bleaching. been three worldwide bleaching events in the last 20 years. The most devastating began in 2014, resulting in the loss of 4,600 square miles of coral. The Great Barrier Reef, the world's largest living structure, lost 30% of its coral, threatening the many species that rely on it for survival. Richard Vivas is a former ad exec who believes he can help by raising awareness. He launched a project called 50 Reefs, which will identify and help document the 50 most protectable reefs around the world. Working with Google, Richard has designed a 360-degree virtual reality camera that can capture remarkably detailed footage. The camera we developed was originally an idea of, well, let's reveal the underwater world. The scientists heard about the camera and saw that this was a way of potentially revolutionizing the study of coral reefs. Richard's footage is detailed enough for scientific study, and his team has designed an algorithm that automatically analyzes the images, which means work that would have taken years can now be completed in hours. And is your footage available to the scientific community? It is literally Google Street View uh, underwater, so anybody in the world can go to any of the locations that we've been to. The idea is these 50 reefs become a catalyst for action. The 50 Reefs team also take their underwater imagery and with VR headsets show local communities what they have to lose. Because a lot of these local communities don't get underwater. And so with this technology, we can come into villages and show people exactly what's under there. <laughs> and is the idea to you know, get them to love what they see first and then be more interested in protecting it? Yes, I mean, you can have that one moment when you're growing up, when you, you see something new for the first time and it sticks with you for the rest of your life. You can't protect an environment like this without 100% local support. Coral reefs are the foundation of the world's underwater ecosystems. If they die, so will the many species that depend on them. And the entire food chain, up to the fish that we consume, could be lost. But does it surprise you that this isn't front page news, that this isn't more of an urgent issue to most of the public? People still seem sort of obsessed with conservation of single species. Yet we've got 
a million species under a more rapid threat um, that's happening right now. And I, I think almost conservation needs a bit of a rethink. One of the world's leading marine biologists is doing just that, pioneering research which could help corals survive. You know, one thing that we're exploring is that corals might be more entrepreneurial in terms of their partners very early in their life history. We try to challenge them with new types and see if they're, oh yeah, I'll give this one a try. Put the right sperm and egg together and, and create the, the super yeah. coral. She calls this process assisted evolution. Once Ruth has identified the strongest species in the lab and helped them breed, the samples are placed amongst reefs that have already been badly damaged. These corals were selected because one coral of the same species, sitting side by side, one of them was healthy and one of them was white bleached. And our question is why? So these are the ones that are really the, the survivors. So what's happening now with, as climate change intensifies, is the number of times that the water is getting warmer is more frequent. And so the time between events isn't now, we think, sufficient for the coral reefs to really sort of recover. But here they're now facing repetitious bleaching yeah. in ways they, they weren't before. Absolutely. Well, it's, it's, before. it's totally unprecedented. You know, I always think of the planet as a jigsaw puzzle, and that there are all these pieces that must fit together to create the picture that is our planet. And when you start pulling pieces out, like the, the coral reef or the polar ice sheet, and that lack of connection and understanding of the way the planet's the system is being affected will ultimately wipe us out as a species. Species go extinct when they can no longer be supported by the place that they live, and that's what we're doing to ourselves. Back in Ruth's lab, she uses a multi-million dollar microscope which shows in stunning detail exactly how corals react to increasing stresses. It's the first time I've seen them where you can really see that they're living things. You're almost communicating with the corals because you can push it until you That's see right. levels exactly of stress and then, That's and then right. put it back in again. They tell you exactly what they feel. And that's, you know, that's kind of crazy, isn't it? You're looking at a living organism. A reef would cross its strongest members naturally over a 30 to 50 year period. We don't have 30 to 50 years. These images help Ruth experiment with ways to build stronger species. You know, originally this project was called the Super Coral Project. Okay, I'm going out on the reef, I'm finding my best coral performers. I bring it into the lab, I train it on an environmental treadmill to improve its capacity to withstand these temperatures. We then do what human athletes often do, which is to meet somebody uh, in the gym of the opposite sex and have extremely gifted <laughs> off offspring. And we do exactly the same with our corals. There is an urgent, urgent problem that needs to be met with a very, very creative solution. And I'll use an example like the closure of the ozone hole. That was a radical change in planetary behavior that enabled that to occur. And we all did it. Ruth's work is looking like a viable solution, if it can be applied to scale. In Curaçao, we met with a team of scientists called SeaCore, who are trying to solve the problem of scalability. They are here to gather the larvae of a brain coral, their first step in a plan to repopulate reefs worldwide. This coral species, like most of the corals, is a hermaphroditic. It means each polyp is female and male. So they produce sperm and eggs. They get together to what we call egg sperm bundles. They are released, you can see that really nicely, very exciting, and they drift to the water surface. And this spawning only happens when there's a full moon? It is related to the full moon, so those, those corals cannot walk around and say, hey, I'm ready for sex. <laughs> yeah. So they have to have this arrangement, okay, we all spawn together, if you spawn alone, you won't find a partner to yeah. mate. They're very tuned in. About 6.30, it's time to go. Once in the water, they rely on the sea life to point them in the right direction. There's a certain butterfly fish species. Once they get around the brain coral, get excited, then we know that okay, this coral is going to spawn. Once the butterfly fish have identified the right corals, Dirk and his team cover them in tents 
to collect the sperm and eggs which are about to be released. After they've collected enough samples, they need to get them back to the lab for fertilization. In nature, the coral's reproductive success rate is just 0.2%. We usually get between 90% and, and almost 100% of the eggs fertilized, which in nature will not happen. It's a huge step in solving the problem of scalability. So how close are you from getting the potentially hundreds of thousands of coral that's there to being hundreds of thousands of coral in the ocean? In a few years from now. Yeah. <laughs> The next problem is how to spread these hundreds of thousands of fertilized eggs across a wide area. These easily made cement tetrapods are covered with coral larvae. The tetrapods can then be easily distributed wherever they are needed, and the coral can grow. Once you've figured it out, once you, you know you can do it to scale, all you have to do is get enough of these somewhere that you can essentially push them into the areas where they need to be. That's it. That's the solution, <laughs> that's, right? that's it. It's another huge step in finding a solution that can be applied on a worldwide scale. Very cheap. That's very, very important for restoration that you look at the costs. This is a dollar or two dollars makes a big difference. Wood gates can look into assisted evolution, but if you cannot buy that on scale, it's worth it. So you have a blueprint? Yes. What, what would you actually need to put that in place? Resources. We need money. So how much? A collective $100 million project that would create the networks that would enable the science to be convened with practitioners quickly. If the scale and cause of the coral's destruction can be perfectly understood, if its most resilient species can be selected or bred, and if those species can then be spread wherever they are needed on a massive scale, these scientists may have solved one of the most significant environmental problems of our age. Can you describe what the world looks like without coral reefs? A world without reefs is a world where there are places without food, places where there's nowhere to live. They are critically important to coastal security and economies. The rates of change in our environment are far outpacing the intrinsic capacity of coral reefs to survive. If we don't mitigate at all, coral reefs will not be the thing that we're worrying about. It will be the survival of our species. This sounds like the perfect project, crying out for someone to come in and say, OK, I'm going to coordinate a global effort to, to do exactly what Absolutely. we're Absolutely. How do we make these tools make a difference on site in many places? We have to be absolutely functional in 10 years. We have to stop planning and we need to start doing it.